Hello, third graders. This is The Journey, Stories of Migration by Cynthia Ryland. Cynthia Ryland, what, should, what advice does an award-winning famous author like Cynthia have for young writers? Go out and play. Playing is still the greatest th training you can have, I think, for, be for becoming a writer, says Ryland. It helps you love life, it helps you relax, and it helps you cook up interesting stuff in your head. She is the author of The Blue Hill Meadows and many other books. <coughs> Most creatures live out their lives in the places where they are born. The tiny mouse runs in the fields where his mother ran. The gray squirrel lives in the same tall trees all her life. The cow stays on the farm. But there are some creatures who do not stay where they are born, who cannot stay. These are the creatures who migrate. Their lives will be spent moving from one place to another. Some will migrate to survive. Some will migrate to create new life. All will be remarkable. Here are the stories of two of these remarkable travelers, so different from each other, but so alike in one profound way. Each must move. The Locusts. There are few there are few migrations as dramatic and frightening as when the desert locusts are moving across Africa. These insects are actually young grasshoppers, and grasshoppers usually do not travel. But some sometimes too many grasshopper eggs are laid in one small area. And when the grasshoppers are born, there isn't enough food. The grasshoppers now have only one choice for survival, to migrate in search of vegetation. And so these grasshoppers will begin changing. Their bodies will turn from light green to dark yellow or red. Their antenna will grow short rather than long. And when they rise up to fly together by the billions, they will be grasshoppers no more. They will be locusts. A cloud of desert locusts in the sky is an unbelievable sight. There are so many locusts that they block out the sun. It seems like night, and in the sudden darkness there is a terrible thunderous noise. It is the noise of a billion wings. What words help you visualize how it looks and sounds when the locusts fly away together. It helps to use those incredible words. What happens next is even more incredible. When locusts fly to the ground, they will eat every plant, every blade of grass, every leaf and bush and piece of vegetation as far as the eye can see. Within minutes, they will fly off again, leaving behind them a total devastated landscape. And though locusts do not willfully hurt people, they want only to eat gardens, trees, bushes, grass. People may die because of the locusts, because the gardens are empty of food. People may die of starvation. Desert locusts can also cause accidents. Locusts fly very high, as high as two miles up in the sky, and this can make it difficult flying for planes that have to move through the locust cloud. The swarms can also interfere with trains, and millions of crushed locusts on a highway will make cars slip and slide. There are so many stories in history about the terrible devastation of locust plagues. It is written that in ancient times, one locust swarm covered 2,000 square miles. The swarms today are not nearly as large as that, but they can still be quite big, often as much as 100 square miles. Imagine so many insects in the sky. This would be terrifying. See the locust eggs? Long and thin, and whole clusters of them. 
As the locusts migrate in search of food, they ride the winds from one area of rainfall to the next. There is always more food where it rains. They travel on sunny mornings and stop in late afternoon to roost for the night. When they reach a rainy area, they mate and die. Then their eggs will hatch and a new swarm of locusts begin moving. This will happen again and again until one day a swarm will return to the same place where the very first locust began. And if the eggs laid are not too many, and if there, are pl there is plenty of food where the new eggs hatch, there will be no locust swarms for a while only pale green grasshoppers moving quietly about. But someday, too many eggs will be laid, and the newly hatched grasshoppers will be much too hungry. These grasshoppers will begin to look a little different, and act a little different. Then they will rise up together by the billions as desert locusts, and they will fly. The whales. Many my mammals migrate, but no mammal migrates as far as the great gray whale. It travels 6,000 miles, then back again, and most of its traveling is done on an empty stomach. Gray whales love the cold waters near the North Pole because the waters are full of the food they love to eat. The whales live on tiny ocean shrimp and worms, and the Arctic waters are full of these in summer. The whales eat and eat and eat, straining the tiny food through strips of baleen in their mouths. Instead of teeth, the, gray, the grays have baleen, long strips of hard material similar to fingernails. The gray whales swim and eat mostly alone through the summer, but in the fall, they will begin to look for some traveling companions because the whales know one thing for certain, that they must migrate. In winter, the Arctic seas are going to be filled with solid ice and the whales will die if they stay. The first gray whales to leave the Arctic are the pregnant females. These expectant mothers want to have plenty of time to reach the warm waters of California and Mexico before they give birth. No mother wants to have a baby in ice water. The other whales will follow, and in small groups they will all travel down the Pacific coast. Once they leave the Arctic, the whales won't find much food again, and it may be as long as eight months before they eat. But the whales have stored a lot of fat in their bodies, called blubber, and this will keep them alive. As they travel, the whales often swim near shore, and people along the way are thrilled. They wave to the whales from rocky cliffs and travel out in boats to say hello to them. When finally the gray whales reach the warm tropical waters in January, the pregnant females will give birth, and the other whales will mate. The last time I was in Oregon, we stopped at a roadside uh, rest stop with a bathroom in it and a bunch of parking. And we were basically on a cliff, I would say 100, 150 feet tall. And there were some scientists over on one side of it, all set up, and they had a sign, and they were watching gray whales. And we got to watch them for probably a half hour while they moved past. They would dive and they were timing the the dives and calculating how deep they were going. And so there was seven or eight minutes between uh, breaching when they came up for another breath of air. It was really cool. With new calves among them, all of the whales will enjoy life in the peaceful lagoons for a while. Then in March, they will be ready to head back to the Arctic for the summer. They haven't forgotten how they love to eat there. This time, the males will leave first, 
and the females and calves will stay behind for another several weeks. The calves will have more time to grow and get stronger for the long journey. The arrows on the map show the gray whale's 6,000 mile journey from the Arctic, then back again. Go clear up between Russia and Alaska into the Arctic Ocean over there. Finally, all the whales will travel up past Oregon, past Washington, through the waters of Alaska and Asia, up near the North Pole. How do the whales find these Arctic waters? No one is sure. The whales might follow the shape of the ocean beds. They might sense the Earth's magnetic field, like living compasses. They may use echolocation, sending out sounds which bounce back and describe what is all around. But somehow the whales will travel that long 6,000 mile journey north and they will find the same chilly waters they left behind. When they arrive in the Arctic, they will separate and enjoy a summer of fine ocean eating. Okay, what is the same about the two trips that the males make, whales make, and what is different? Remember how one group left early to go south and the other group left early going north? There's your hint. But just before the Arctic winter arrives, before the ice, something will tell the whales to find each other again, to find some company for another long, long swim. All right, well, let's go back and look at the vocabulary. There we go. We have migrate. These butterflies fly far away when they migrate or move from place to place. You know this term from science class. We talk about migration of the geese. Um, we see that all the time here at home. The songbirds have arrived. The robin showed up about a month ago or so. So we have all sorts of examples of migrating creatures around us. Number two, survive. This bluebird flies south through the winter for its survival or to stay alive. So when you are in survival mode, all you're worried about is eating, drinking, shelter. Those three things that you have to have to live. And so the bluebird flies south because if it stayed up here, it wouldn't be able to find food because it could be covered with snow and it could freeze to death. Number three, plenty. Some animals don't migrate in winter if they have saved plenty of food. So, see the squirrel does not migrate. It hides nuts and seeds and things that it's collected. Bears hibernate in the winter because they have saved up plenty of food in the fat that they've stored. And so they will lose sometimes over a third of their body weight between the time they climb in their den to when they come out for the last time in the spring. Number four, frightening. It is frightening or scary for penguins when leopard seals come nearby. When something is threatening you, is dangerous to you, you feel frightened. Another word for that would be scared. And that is a survival instinct. Yelling at your brain, hey, get out of there. Protect yourself. Accidents. When moose cross busy roads to find food, accidents can happen. Hitting a moose would be much worse than hitting a deer. Um, you hit them in the knees and they roll into your windshield. 
from what I understand. Those creatures are the size of a bull. Number six, solid. It is very hard for animals to find food under snow and solid ice. Solid is hard. Number seven, chili. Polar bears have thick fur to keep them warm in cold, chilly weather. Cold and chilly are synonyms for the most part. Landscape. The landscape changes in spring. Grass turns green and flowers bloom. So you probably know of landscaping companies around town. They do the hedge trimming and lawn mowing and weed eating and that type of thing. They'll also build uh, retaining walls and change the landscape of your yard if you hire them to do that. Thunderous. A herd of caribou make a very loud thunderous sound as it runs. Imagine all 300 plus of us in the gym running around in a circle. You wouldn't be able to hear yourself think. It would be thunderous. And 10. Dramatic. Salmon swimming upstream to lay eggs is a dramatic or exciting sight. So exciting and dramatic are synonyms in this use. All right. I hope you guys are well. Take care, and I miss you.